Fox 5 and Hot 97 present Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers. I'm so glad you're joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers as we celebrate trailblazing women. Women continue to make tremendous progress in many areas, but there are still challenges and outdated attitudes that can trip us up. In this episode, we're celebrating and getting to know some extraordinary women trailblazers and getting tips on how to keep going when the going gets rough. For decades, women law enforcement officers have comprised only about 12% of officers in the United States, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. That's a stark underrepresentation, according to the latest Census Bureau estimates, which show just over 50% of the U.S. population is female. NYPD First Deputy Commissioner Tanya Kinsella is a trailblazer as the number two leader in the department, second only to Police Commissioner Edward Caban. She worked her way up starting as a beat officer on Staten Island. With more women and in, in recruiting more women to the police department and within the higher ranks, not just as cops, not just as civilians, but in higher ranks, it adds to emotional intelligence. It, uh, it adds to the understanding of the human side of policing. Dr. Jacqueline Fulop Goodling, better known professionally as Dr. Jackie Smiles, was drawn to dentistry as a child and became the first female director of the orthodontic department at the prestigious Boston University Dental School. She has private practices in New York and Florida. At her main office in Midtown, there's an all-female staff. They all work hard, so Dr. Jackie makes it fun at holiday time. While she makes it look glamorous and easy, she admits there's a lot more to it. Running a small business with all the hats that we wear, of being a friend, a mother, a, a, a small business owner, and the lights go on, and with all of the rules and regulations and CE credits and maintaining your license. Architect Kimberly Dowdell made history when she was named the 100th president of the American Institute of Architects and the first black woman in that position. She says seeing buildings abandoned and torn down as a child inspired her to be a positive force for change. Dowdell believes that buildings can do more than just serve their physical purpose. I wanted to help people. Um, and, and I felt like being an architect would help me to, um, to, to be supportive of my community and kind of healing not just the buildings, but the people that, you know, are impacted by the buildings. Dodell says it took years of hard work to reach your goal, but she stayed the course. Set your sights on the end goal. It is a, a long and winding road. Um, it's certainly not easy, but it's so worth it. Let's get right to it now with our panel. Joining me for this show is Kimberly Dowdell. She's the 2024 AIA president, the first African-American woman to hold that prestigious post. Um, she's also an architect. We're going to find out all about that, what that all means. Kimberly, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's a delight to be here. We, we appreciate it. Also with us from the NYPD is De First Deputy Commissioner Tiny Kinsella. She is the first woman of color to hold that position. She's out in the community a lot. You see her on her Instagram out there talking with the kids, inspiring the community, checking in, making sure everything is good and building relationships between the NYPD and the community. Commissioner, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Lisa. We appreciate it. Also with us is Dr. Jackie Smiles. She's an orthodontist, trailblazing orthodontist, and we're gonna hear about that in just a moment. And also the national spokesperson for Invisalign. Dr. Jackie, thank you so much for being with us. He said, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate it. Kimberly, I want to start with you on this because you're the first, you're a female architect, which I think that's that's got to be a tremendous accomplishment as it is because you're dealing, I assume, with the construction industry and, and all of that type of thing. How did you get interested in that? Yeah, when I was about 11 years old growing up in Detroit, Michigan, um, Detroit at that time was undergoing a lot of disinvestment. And so there were buildings all around me that were getting closed down, demolished. And, you know, I really felt like if I became an architect, I could help to uh, stave off some of that, um, you know, some some of the sort of trauma that comes with buildings kind of disappearing and, you know, the crime and things that were happening at that time. Um, this was like the early 90s. And so I said, I actually learned what an art architect did in a middle school art class. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm a big champion for arts and education. And I just said, if I became an architect, then I can um, really help to improve conditions for my community. And I've been sort of at this work for 30 years now, which has been pretty exciting. And it's just, it's an honor to serve as the first black woman uh, president of the American Institute of Architects. I'm also an architect at uh, HOK, 
which is a large design firm that um, that also has a studio in New York where I spent um, some of my early uh, early career years and uh, we also designed LaGuardia Airport, so Terminal B. Oh, wow. So for those who uh, <laughs> enjoy the the new airport, you're welcome. <laughs> Design the airport. Okay, that's not, that's not like okay. We're gonna build a we're gonna build a family room, or we're gonna add an addition, <laughs> add a swim, build a swimming pool, an airport. That's incredible. We're gonna hear more about that in just a moment. Dr. Jackie Smiles, how did you get interested in this whole field of dentistry and orthodontist and become an orthodontist? I have family who, uh, uh, my uncle's an orthodontist, and I so enjoyed being in his practice when I was younger. And it's just the perfect blend between science and art. He was always happy, his patients, it was busy, it was upbeat, he had great music. And I said, wow, I want to emulate him. And it was, it, it really has come true. I was 11 then. And years later, I was born in me, you know, to be an orthodontist. You also were the first female professor in your field at Boston University. Tell us about that. Do I have that right? Correct. So I was the, the youngest and the first female director of a, a department at the dental school. And that was the orthodontic department. So I graduated and I was part of a study team helping the underclassmen in certain sciences and gross anatomy and neurosciences. And I enjoyed it very much. And the director came to me and simply said, how would you like to apply for the position? We're interviewing people all over the U.S. And I became the first female and the youngest. So I graduated uh, graduated in August and September, I became the director. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations on that. Thank Deputy you. Commissioner Tanya Kinsella, you started as a beat cop on the streets. What made you want to get into law enforcement? To be honest with you, I never wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be a lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer, actually, growing up. And one day I went to John Jay College in the city, and one day you, we had the job fairs, and they would say, you, you take the test on a Saturday. So I took the test on a Saturday, and within two months they called me because I did so well on the exam, and they, they told us to start and pay, and I was like, $36,000? still living at home, sign me up, and I could do this while I go to law school. And it was the best decision of my life. Stay with us, there's more to come. When I have those down days, I say, fix your crown and let's go. Kimberly, you're the first woman of this association with architects. Have you ever had to walk into the room and be treated? expect to be treated like an equal or respected for your position and your opinions and find that you're the only woman in that room? Yeah, so I'm actually um, I'm the seventh woman to be elected AI president. The first one was actually only in 1992. The organization was founded in 1857. So it's been a, a long time. Um, so I'm the first Black woman here in 2024. And it took, you know, obviously a long time to get there. And so I often enter rooms where uh, within architects, there are only 120,000 architects in the country. And of that number, only around 600 are Black women. So we're less than half a percent of the entire population of architects. And so it's pretty rare to see, um, you know, someone who looks like me in not only this position, but just generally um, throughout the country in the profession. So I often encounter rooms where I'm the only woman or only person of color, and certainly, you know, the only woman of color. And I often, um, you know, feel the question, so this one particular question from young women, do I ever encounter uh, imposter syndrome? And, you know, I have to, um, I always tell them no, because, and I, I also encourage them to think about the fact that if you're in these rooms, you're meant to be there. Like you're there for a reason. It's a very, um, it's a very rigorous uh, sort of profession to, to pursue. It takes on average about 13 years to become a licensed architect. Wow. And so if you, get into architecture school, get through the five, six, or seven years of education, um, you know, complete the six exams and the, you know, hours and hours of, of experience that's required. You deserve to be in those rooms and you have to, you know, keep your head held high and know that you have an important perspective to bring to that work. And so that's something I consistently tell uh, younger women. And um, I think that's so important to making sure that, that they uh, remain confident in their ability, even when they are the only woman. Um, you know, in, in the room. And I think it's important that architects represent the communities that they serve. 
because you know design is something that impacts everyone. Dr. Jackie, what about you moving it, walking into a room full of men? Tell us about that. So Kimberly, it's interesting that you said that. I do believe and I tell a lot of my female patients or other women, I have an all female in office team. So there's 27 of us. Wow. And I always said it has nothing to do with being a male or a female. It's really whoever's qualified best for that position. And um, when they ask me, I say, always strive to be the best version of yourself, no matter what. But when I started yeah. dental school, 17% were females. And now it's closer to 50-50, which I love. We do add a little bit of a different flair or flavor to that room, to that creativity, to that architectural project, to that crime situation, to that dental smile. Tiny, the, uh, the NYPD has made a lot of strides in recent years with women and especially women in, in leadership positions uh, like yourself. But t tell us how you've handled, I mean, I'm sure there were there are times where people were not, some of the men were not necessarily as open-minded as, as uh, so many more are today. So over, over, it's been almost 21 years that I've become a cop. And the first time I was an officer, my first precinct, the one to precinct was predominantly Caucasian males. And I was the only, one of the only females, maybe three other female uh, blacks in, in the pre entire precinct. Wow. And it started from since then. And I knew very early on in my career that I wanted to elevate all the way to the top because it was important for women to see women like myself thrive and do well. And one of my earliest interactions was as a, as a lieutenant. And I had a male commanding officer tell me that you cannot become a captain because you you you're good, you have the kids, you have two children now, and you cannot elevate in this with the schedule and do the job and run a precinct and have a family. And at that moment, a light switch went in my head. And I said to myself, Tanya, you're going to become a, a commanding officer. And the commanding officer is, is the head of a precinct. And I did it. And my first pure precinct was the PSA one in housing in Brooklyn. And it was a, it's a male dominated field. Out of 77 precincts, I was one of seven commit precinct command, female commanders. And we weren't given heavy command precincts because that, that wasn't known in the police department. So every time I went up for every meeting and I was one of the only females, like Kimberly said, I held my head up high. I owned that room and I, I knew what I was talking about when I went into these meetings and no one interrupted me. No one, I knew who I was and what I was about. And I represented all women, not just myself. Out of the largest police department in the world, less than 20% are women. Oh, wow, that's incredible. That's less than 20% of women. And now with, you know, Police Commissioner Caban nominating me to be his first dep, I'm not just sitting here being a figurehead. I'm pulling other women up. Sometimes men will make dumb, I love men, don't get me wrong, but sometimes they'll make dumb comments. And sometimes it's a generational thing. Sometimes it's a regional thing. It depends what part of the country you're at, which kind of crowd you're with or whatever. How do you guys deal with those? It's not always the best, the best route, but I match energy with energy. So what you give me, I'm gonna give you because I have experience. I'm not elected. I, I was started out as a beat cop. I took three exams and then with hard work and determination, I, I was elected to in deputy inspector, inspector chief, and then now first death. I went through the ranks. So sometimes you do get that male aggression or even unfortunately other women uh, d downplaying, you know, my roles and our roles. And I'm, I, I'm very quick to give you, educate you on my background. Sometimes I just ignore it and sound out the noise because a lot of it is noise and it's, it's, it's made to take us off and give us that imposter syndrome to make us feel like we're not the queens that we are. Right. Lisa, you know what I always, I tell my team, because we deal with so many, especially in Midtown Manhattan, so many different populations of patients. I always look at the girls and I say, you can't control what someone says to you, but you can control how you react to it. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And do it politely, 
confidently and calmly. So don't get a reaction and, and try to be proactive, not reactive. And it really works. Yeah, I actually appreciate that, um, you know, that that advice. And I try to use it myself when I run into situations. I have a very specific story I'm going to share with the group okay, here. Great. Um, so this is a few years ago now, and I um, I was president of a different organization, the National Organization of Minority Architects, and I was uh, representing that group as president. Um, and it was a national um, uh, conference where people from all over the country were convened. And uh, this group of folks, I decided at lunch to kind of join their their table. And they're from, um, you know, from somewhere that maybe uh, didn't experience many people who, who look like me. And so they asked, are you here as part of the entertainment? No. And yeah, and I was like, wow. So I really, you know, to, to the point that was just made about um, controlling your reaction, um, I had to really take a moment to think about what was the most appropriate response to that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to remain presidential. So I just simply say, no, I'm an architect just like you are. That was one of the most surreal moments of my career, especially in leadership and um, confronting people who um, who just really don't understand, um, you know, where, where I'm coming from or who I am. How do you keep the negativity from sometimes seeping in? It's not always easy, but the lights have to go on. People rely on you. Right. Um, and you just have to start your day. And there's many times that I sit there at the edge of the bed and I say, no. Every day, try to strive to be the best version of yourself. And that's okay. it. Absolutely. I think you have to su surround yourself with with positivity. You know, negativity is sort of a inevitable thing that, you know, we all encounter, but you have to surround yourself with the people and sort of the practices that kind of help you stay grounded. And I think about um, my grandmother who's, um, who's, who's uh, departed at this point, but she started her every day, her day every day with, um, you know, her prayer circle and her, you know, reading her Bible. And so I, I borrowed that from her and said, that's a good grounding for me in, in the morning. And, you know, it's having great friends and mentors and people who are like champions and like who support you. But you know what? What Kimberly said, it's about surrounding yourself with positive people, with people in your circle that's going to push you, that's going to motivate you. And for me, when I have those down days, which are far and few between, I say my 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 circle, they're like, listen, you own this. Yeah. You got this. Fix your crown and let's go. Kimberly, I'll start with you. It's like how how do you you say you start every day with a prayer? Are there other certain things that you do to really make you know to maintain your best self so you can be the most? Yeah, I, th I think starting the day with that anchor is really important. Um, but also, um, I believe in this this concept of, of 360 mentorship. And so, uh, of course, I have people who have been in my life for decades at this point who've given me advice and helped me navigate career challenges and opportunities, but also making sure that I'm intentional about reaching back to younger people. Uh, so I'm actually a, a trustee at my alma mater, um, Cornell. And you know, I, I use that opportunity to kind of connect with um, with with young people, young women in particular. Um, and so, I just think it's important to make sure that you know, not only am I a resource to young people, but that I'm um, you know sharing my insight with with people certainly in my peer group, but then those who are ahead of me, and then just making sure that everyone is is staying connected. Tanya, what about you? Like Kimberly, I love being intentional, giving back, and mentoring. I'm a big going big. I never turn down a community event, even if I have to bring my children with me. I love talking to our youth. I love going to the communities and letting other women see that there's not just male men at the top. There's women at the top as well. And it's important that we give back and we are, we're intentional in giving back in mentoring. Jackie, you've done a lot of, you've done a lot of mentoring with a lot of the women that have worked on your staff over the years, why is that such an important part of your 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 whole business and your practice? Um, it, it's well, two th twofold. One is it's hard to give one hundred and ten percent of your time and always be on, especially when you're being pulled in so many different directions. Our motto is um, always try to be confident, courageous, and contagious. So even when you're not, step back. I have it on my website. 
Okay. So step back, breathe. It's okay. Take a lap. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers on Trailblazing Women. I hope you were as inspired as we were. You can watch it again and share it on our Fox 5 and Y YouTube page. Remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon. I'm Lisa Evers. Let's push for peace, love, and justice for all.